virtues of, uh, of virtual seminars is being able to, uh, to reach somewhat further afield uh, geographically than we would in a, a usual year. Uh, so we're delighted to be able to take advantage of that today uh, with uh, Dietrich Kreisen, who is joining us from the University of Heidelberg. Um, Dietrich uh, got his PhD at uh, Utrecht and uh, was a postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysic in Garching before, uh, before moving to University of Heidelberg. Um, he's also been a, a visitor at, uh, at Leiden and Cambridge and, uh, and the MPIA in Heidelberg. Um, he's now an, an Emmy Noether uh, research group leader. And uh, although we haven't met, I, I hear a lot about him at Ohio State because he's, he's really uh, one of the, the premier people in, in connecting uh, you know, the, the most high powered current observations of the interstellar medium in nearby galaxies to theoretical understanding of, of what's going on. Um, so I hear about uh, him a lot through, uh, through Adam Leroy and the FANGS project. Um, and uh, I I can look forward to a great talk. So, uh, with, and I'll remind people that uh, if you want to join our follow-up conversation, that will be at at 1:30 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. Um, and Diedrich, take it away. Thank you, David. Thank you very much for well for your for your kind and generous introduction, uh, and in particular, of course, also for the invitation. Um, it's a little bit embarrassing. I've actually never visited Princeton, so for me, it's already a major step to do so virtually. And uh, hopefully we get to follow up on that uh, at some point in the future. Um, so I'll, I'll share screen. Uh, and I uh, this worked five minutes ago, so I hope it still does. Looks good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, I would like to talk about how the the clustered nature of stars, uh, both at the time of their formation, but also afterwards. Uh, has shaped our origins, basically from the formation and evolution of galaxies like the Milky Way to the formation and evolution of planetary systems like our solar system. And uh, of course, you know, that, that is a somewhat ambitious goal for even a single colloquium. So this is going to be somewhat eclectic. And uh, what it also means is that basically each of the topics I will touch on, I could probably have given an individual colloquium on. Uh, so there will be a little bit of scope at the expense of depth, but I'm very happy to, to try and deepen uh, the discussion uh, either during the, the discussion afterwards or, or the session we'll have later today. Um, yeah, so why would you want to, to try and, and, and connect all of these things? Because in a way that is what astrophysics does at large and it might seem overly ambitious to try and do that, but I think it's relevant. And there've been a number of recent developments uh, mostly observationally, but also computationally that now allow this. And that's why I'm excited to share that with you today. And the story basically starts when you look at a very large cosmological, cosmological volume like this. And you know, we've all seen these images and the way I tend to look at them is um, actually not just looking at the dark matter distribution like we do here, this is actually illustrious TNG. Um, but I try to imagine that every pixel here contains countless planets. And of course, there is a huge dynamic range in between. In fact, if you, if you do the math and you, you compare the size scales, this enormous sort of gap in between spans 18 orders of magnitude, which is an intimidating scale, an intimidating uh, dynamic range. But thankfully, you know, if we look at the astrophysics at large, we can cut this up into multiple chunks that are actually quite manageable. Um, and that allows us then to start addressing this, this, this question is, okay, how do we go from, from the cosmic web to planets like the earth? And that gap makes our existence one of the biggest multi-scale astrophysics problems. And you can address that by, by making small steps. So the first one you can take is basically going from the cosmic web to individual galaxies. and the, the step made here is of the order 10 to the four in spatial scale. From those galaxies, you can take a step further down to individual stellar clusters within those galaxies, which are another factor of a thousand smaller. And then within those stellar clusters, of course, you've got stars, uh, which when they form have protoplanetary disks around them, which are another factor of 10 to the four smaller than the cluster itself. 
And I don't know about you, but in my mind, at this point, I'm nearly there, right? I'm nearly at the planet. It turns out there's another 10 to the seven going from a protoplanetary disk to an Earth-sized planet. So this is really a vast range of scales. But it turns out they're all connected. And the way they are connected is actually revolving around the stellar clustering, which I've put in the middle here. And the stellar clustering is, is, is essential in many ways. So towards larger scales, stellar clustering drives the baryon cycle within galaxies. The fact that star formation is clustered and sources of stellar feedback within galaxies are clustered, turns out is a really critical element of deciding how galaxies grow their mass, both in, both in gas and in stars eventually. But then in turn, the long-lived relics of stellar clustering, globular clusters, allow you to trace galaxy formation and assembly because they basically have, in, in, they carry an imprint of what the conditions were of the star formation, the feedback, the galaxy formation assembly uh, at the time of their own formation. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well, showing basically how we can learn to use that to reconstruct the assembly history of the Milky Way. Now we then start zooming in towards smaller scales Stellar clustering uh, is an important factor in perturbing and destroying protoplanetary disks. And depending on the time scales on which this happens, it can actually leave an imprint on, on the planet formation process and the planet population. And then finally, what I'll uh, discuss towards the end of the talk is that stellar clustering actually modifies the properties of the planet population. And I think if we bring all of these things together, we start to see a picture in which all of those scales are indeed connected. And it's an enormous challenge to try and, and make this tractable, try and make this understandable. So I'll start with the first one in, in terms of how does stellar clustering drive the baryon cycle within galaxies? Can we somehow try and identify fundamental units within galaxies that are sort of the important chunks in, in driving this baryon cycle? And from the numerical side and numerical simulations, this is actually a very extensively studied problem. So I'll show two examples here of showing how important the, the small scale baryonic physics of star formation and feedback are. And the first here is, is here on the left. It's already quite old. Um, this is a study by Phil Hopkins from 2013, where he simulated exactly the same initial conditions with exactly the same physics, except for the star formation model. So in each of those three panels, there were different conditions that the gas needs to satisfy in the simulation in order to be converted into stars. In the top panel, the gas needs to be self-gravitating. In the middle panel, it needs to be above a certain density threshold. And in the bottom panel, it needs to be in a molecular state. That's the only difference between these simulations. And you see that there are qualitative differences in terms of how these galaxies are structured. Now here on the right, uh, I'm showing work by Ben Keller, uh, who's working with us here in Heidelberg, um, who's basically been simulating the same galaxy. The only thing that he varied here is the supernova delay time. Uh, so in the first panel, supernovae detonate immediately when a star particle is born, whereas in the bottom right panel, uh, they detonate about 30 mega years after the star particle is born. Now, this is of course is ad hoc, um, but it demonstrates how important it is to get the small scale details of stellar feedback right in order to reproduce or to, in order to get a predictive model for what your galaxy structure should look like. And the reason that this is so uh, important is that many of the choices that are made here actually make a lot of sense. And we don't know which of these captures the correct physics. And that means that we, in order to address this, what you need is actually you need empirical answers to these questions. Of what should we be using in numerical simulations? And this is really a really complex problem because stellar feedback is a combination of a, a bunch of different mechanisms. And, and even worse, it's a nonlinear combination. So stars exert feedback on their surrounding medium through stellar winds, through supernovae, which I already mentioned, but also through photoionization, photoevaporation, radiation pressure, protostellar outflows. And the critical element here is really all of these feedback mechanisms, except maybe supernovae, but for stellar populations still, act in terms of rates of energy and momentum deposition. So in order to constrain these, what you really need is an observational measurement of the timescales on which the stellar feedback uh, affects the surrounding interstellar medium. Of course, this is extremely challenging. If we're lucky, we get to live 100 years, um, not at all the timescales over which these feedback mechanisms act. So you need to use some form of statistical inference to try and understand this. Basically, if we reduce this to a very fundamental question is, 
We want to know what the impact is of stellar feedback on the uh, giant molecular cloud population in galaxies on the interstellar medium. We're effectively reducing the question to, okay, if a giant molecular cloud is forming stars, do these stars, are these able to destroy that molecular cloud quickly? Or are they basically just bubbling away? Is that molecular cloud sitting there forming many generations of stars, which would lead to a very uh, quiescent evolution of a galaxy? A galaxy would have a very different morphology as we saw earlier when we looked at the supernova delay times, how big that impact is on what a galaxy looks like. So, are GMCs destroyed rapidly, or are they in some form of quasi-equilibrium between star formation and feedback? Now, it turns out that this actually, th th this question, this, this nice dichotomy, leads to two distinct empirical predictions. So, in the first, if molecular clouds are destroyed quickly, the molecular clouds and H2 regions, which is where the young stars are sitting, should rarely coexist. Basically, you form a GMC, you get your young stars, the young stars blow up the GMC, and all you've got are those young stars. Now, if GMCs exist in this sort of quasi-equilibrium between star formation and feedback, then GMCs would form stars for many dynamical times, and it means you would see molecular clouds in H2 regions in the same spots pretty much all the time. Now, this is something we can now test with ALMA. And uh, this is a paper we published about two years ago. Uh, and I'm about to show an observational movie. It doesn't happen often, so I'm quite excited that we made an observational movie. Uh, in the top left panel, you see H-alpha emission uh, in uh, nearby galaxy NGC 300. And H-alpha is uh, tracing the young stars, which is massive stellar emission. Uh, the top right panel is showing the CO, so it's the molecular gas that traces the molecular clouds. And in the bottom left panel, you see the ratio between the two. So it's effectively the gas mass divided by the star formation rate. And I'll get back to the bottom right panel in a bit. Now, at the moment, everything is convolved towards the large scale on which we know that all galaxies have roughly the same ratio between molecular gas mass and star formation rate. The question now is, as we start zooming in, are we going to see H-alpha and CO emission in the same place or in a different place? because that'll tell us what happens to these life cycles. And in the bottom left panel, you'll be able to see this as if they're sitting in the same place, it's roughly white. And if it's not in the same place, it's gonna be bright red and bright, bright blue. So now the movie starts playing and we're increasing the resolution. And the bottom left panel shows us unambiguously that we get bright blue and bright red regions. What this means is that the molecular cloud life cycle in this galaxy here, NGC 300, is rapid, and that stellar feedback destroys molecular clouds very rapidly. And the bottom right panel is basically another way of, of showing that here as a function of the resolution on the x-axis, basically how that ratio between CO and H-alpha emission changes around CO peaks and around H-alpha peaks. So, what we learned to do with this uh, uh, sort of decorrelation between CO and H alpha emission is to actually interpret that in terms of time scales. And I won't get into the details here of, of how we did that, but you can basically, as a function of the underlying time scales, you can predict how this uh, diagram here in the bottom right, how that will look like. So the dotted lines that you see here are basically our statistical model that is a function of just the underlying time scales. And that way, way you can measure how long the uh, CO and the H alpha coexist. What that, what that tells us is how long do the massive stars need in order to blow up the parent molecular cloud. And that time scale is basically what we here call the feedback time scale. And that is shown on the Y axis. So the feedback time scale is the time that the massive stars need to disrupt the parent molecular cloud. And the data points here show that measurement as a function of galactocentric radius in this galaxy, NGC 300. And it's compared to the analytical predictions that we would make for different feedback mechanisms. Now, what we see here is that the time scales we get are short. They're of the order one or two mega years. So massive stars appear and they blow up their parent GMC very quickly. And that's well before supernovae would have a chance to blow up, to affect the, the parent cloud. So what this means is we need early pre-supernova feedback mechanisms to disperse the giant molecular cloud. In particular, it looks like photoionization and stellar winds are potential candidates for doing this. Now, this is for one galaxy. We can now do this with ALMA 
for uh, a large part of the nearby galaxy population. So this is what David mentioned. Uh, we're doing this, among others, in collaboration with Adam Leroy. And uh, this is work led by Melanie Chavance, who is a postdoc here working with us in Heidelberg, who's done this for a first set of of the order 10 galaxies. Uh, and her PhD student, Jay Young Kim, is now doing this for up to 100. And with that, we get basically the opportunity of trying to characterize this evolutionary timeline of molecular cloud evolution, star formation, and stellar feedback uh, as a function of the environment in the local galaxy population. So it's no longer a problem that we're just uh, live for, for, say, 100 years. No, we can actually start measuring those time scales um, statistically. And what we see here is that clouds live for about 10 to 30 mega years. This is not an uncertainty range. You see that the error bars on each measurement are actually considerably smaller. No, this is physical variation between 10 and 30 mega years. And this is about one dynamical time of the uh, molecular clouds. And um, I see a, a, something coming up in the chat. Oh, yeah, that's right. Jayon is coming to speak uh, in a couple of weeks. That's right. So, um, so the clouds live sh have, have short lifetimes, of about one dynamical time. Uh, and for all of them, we pretty much get the same result as for NGC 300, is they're dispersed very quickly in about one to five mega years, which mostly is pre-supernova feedback, especially if you account for uh, stochastic sampling of the initial mass function. Now, interestingly, if we now complement this with some of the MUSE data we've gathered with FANGS, you can look at how uh, the feedback might impact the chemical enrichment of galaxies. And that is shown here on the left. So on the left, <clears throat> I'm, uh, we're, we're showing here what is the metallicity differential locally relative to the large scale metallicity gradient within this galaxy. And this is in the ionized medium. So this is done with uh, ionized line tracers. And what you see is you see a lot, a lot of granularity. There are, there's a range of different colors. And what you can do here is you can calculate what the typical correlation scale is of those chemical inhomogeneities. So what is the scale on which the ionized interstellar medium is found to be inhomogeneous? And what we did here is we correlated that with the velocity at which the feedback front is destroying its parent molecular cloud. And that velocity you basically get from using the time scale that I showed before and the size of the molecular cloud. That gives you a first order estimate of what the velocity is of the feedback front. And it turns out that these are very nicely positively correlated. And what that suggests is that actually, if you have higher feedback velocities, your chemical inhomogeneities are able to extend over, over a larger spatial scale uh, than when you have low feedback velocities. And that suggests that the chemical enrichment and mixing within galaxies are actually feedback driven. They don't come from large scale instabilities or so. Because again, feedback is actually not just driving the life cycle of the interstellar medium, but also its enrichment. Um, as I said, this is actually, this is Jay Yon's work that you see here on the right. So this is exciting. We have a way of actually trying to solve this, of solving the problem that we have in numerical simulations of how to model stellar feedback. And in order to do this, what we need to do is we need to take, we need to take those measurements and turn them into a subgrid model for early pre-supernova feedback. So uh, we've been working with Ben Keller in trying to do this. And you can do this very simply. If you uh, assume a self-similar feedback model, you can express the terminal momentum of your feedback bubble, which is the P here on the left, as a function of the time scale, the cloud radius, and the integrated star formation efficiency that the cloud achieves. And all of these are quantities that we can now measure. Now, if you calculate this number uh, across these 10 nearby galaxies that I just showed uh, for different bins in galactocentric radius, so that's why there are more than 10 data points, you see that this number, this specific terminal momentum, is actually remarkably constant across the galaxy population. So it might be possible to actually just use a single number, at least to simulate nearby universe, local universe galaxies, uh, to, to model their early feedback. And so, so individual points on this plot are of... Yeah. What scale? It's not a point per galaxy, but it's also no. doesn't look like it's a point per per cloud. No, that's right. So because it's a statistical methodology that we use, we need to have of the order of fifty clouds in H two regions per sort of spatial chunk per bin. So we use radial rings that are optimized in width to ensure a sufficiently large number statistically, which then leads to of the order two kiloparsec width of those radial rings, one or two kiloparsec. 
And what is interesting here, if you were to compare this to what you would, would predict for individual feedback mechanisms, so here shown now as a function of the feedback time scale, what is the specific terminal momentum that you would get? It turns out there is no single feedback mechanism that you can use to predict the observation. So if we just use radiation pressure, we would expect the terminal momentum to just increase with the feedback time scale. If we were to use a fully radiative stellar wind, we would expect it to be constant, but much lower. And even if we were to correct our observations for basically the radiative losses you would get in an adiabatic stellar wind, it turns out there is no way we can correct the data points to somehow be consistent with the stellar wind. So the only way of, of solving this nonlinear interplay between all of those different feedback mechanisms and the ambient medium that seems to be taking place in nearby galaxies, the only way of solving this is by using this empirical measured specific terminal momentum. But we can do that now, right? So, so we can take this, so this is the terminal momentum, this is what you get at the end, but if you assume self-similarity, you can basically write this down as a momentum injection rate. So as a, for every time step, okay, what is the amount of momentum that I input in my surrounding medium? And that is what we're doing now in the uh, EMP simulations. EMP stands for Empirically Motivated Physics. Um, and in those simulations, we're, uh, they're, they're performed using a repo. We're using, combining a bunch of different physics. So we have explicit ISM cooling, a cold interstellar medium. Uh, we track the abundances of 36 chemical elements and their isotopes. Uh, we have a star formation model that's sensitive to cloud dynamics. And most importantly, we have this empirically motivated early feedback model that I just showed. So it's basically we're putting in the right answer of the observed cloud life cycle and then ask, do we get out reasonable galaxies? And in addition, we have a subgrid model for star cluster formation and disruption, which I will touch on next in this, uh, in this talk. And I hope the movie works on Zoom, because that's always a big question uh, if, if it is not stuttering. But this is a galaxy simulation, uh, an isolated galaxy, where we have this fully empirical pre-supernova feedback running. Um, so basically, all of the structure you see here is shaped by that. Now. Uh, I don't have many quantitative results yet because this is hot off the press. But one thing we've noticed already uh, looking at this simulation is that the overall star formation rate doesn't change much. But the outflow history from this galaxy is radically different than when you're using, say, supernova feedback, as is typical in cosmological simulations. We basically get a much smoother and uh, more sort of systematically sustained outflow that's much lower than the bursty, spiky outflows that you would get if you only had supernova feedback. So that's already a very concrete, interesting result that we see immediately looking at this simulation. Okay, so what we see here is that we can uh, sort of deconstruct galaxies into, into individual building blocks that drive the baryon cycle within galaxies. And that that clustered nature of the stars as they are born and, and their lifetimes is really important in determining the structure of galaxies and therefore how they end up forming and evolving over cosmic history. Now, as I mentioned, some of the structures that form in these star formation events manage to survive for nearly a Hubble time. And those structures are globular clusters. And in recent years, we've learned to use these to actually try and trace and reconstruct galaxy formation and assembly. Now, globular clusters are pretty unique objects because they're old. They're as old as the oldest galaxies, um, but they don't contain dark matter. Uh, they're massive of the order 10 to the 5 solar masses, and they're remarkably compact. They're probably the most compact stellar systems uh, that we know of. Now, the key questions that we've been trying to focus on here is first is how did globular clusters form? because it's very hard to witness their formation directly uh, at, at redshift of three at the current resolution, right? It's something that maybe with James Webb and 30 meter class telescopes would be possible, and it's something we're actively working towards now. But the most important question is that once you've got a reasonable working model for globular cluster formation, is what do they tell us about the formation and assembly history of the Milky Way? And this is what we've been trying to address with the eMosaics project. So eMosaics, is a project where we basically at first took the large uh, eagle cosmological volume and uh, did a re-simulation of a volume limited sample of Milky Way mass galaxies where we couple the eagle galaxy formation model to the mosaics cluster formation evolution model that 
basically models the formation and dynamical disruption of stellar clusters depending on the local conditions within the galaxies that we simulate. And that's important because it allows us to model self-consistently, basically, how the clusters evolve within those galaxies across cosmic history and basically make a comprehensive model of how the global cluster population might have arisen. And the working hypothesis that we used here is basically, could we try to reproduce the young cluster population that we see in nearby galaxies and the old global cluster population that formed at high redshift with the same model. So not distinguishing between them, but basically just using the same model to see if globular clusters are the relics of, of normal star formation at high redshift. So this is a, a simulation. It's one of the e-mosaic simulations. Uh, what you see here in gray is the gas and the colored dots that you see here are the stellar clusters that are forming as the, the simulation is going. And uh, they're color coded here by the metallicities actually. So the bluish ones are the most metal poor. And then as the, the colors get more uh, vibrant, uh, metallicity goes up. And what you see here is a, a galaxy uh, merging is bringing in its own globular cluster population. So we see we have both in situ globular clusters that formed in the main progenitor, but also ex situ ones that are being accreted here and are populating the halo of the central galaxy. So this is a, a short summary of what we do. So we use basically the hydrodynamics, the stellar evolution and the dynamics from, from Eagle. And then Mosaics uses the hydrodynamics, so the local uh, gas conditions and the local dynamics to motivate the global cluster, the stellar cluster formation. So we uh, have models describing what the fraction is for star formation occurring in, in bound stellar clusters. We have a model for the initial cluster mass function, the maximum cluster mass. And then we also use the dynamics and the stellar evolution to motivate the stellar cluster evolution. So how much mass the clusters lose due to stellar evolution, but also due to two body relaxation within the cluster and tidal shocks from passing substructure as they're orbiting their host galaxy. Can I ask, so in your lower left ellipse there, yeah. gamma, MGMC, MC star, those, those are model parameters. They're not things you're trying to compute from. No, we, for we, so we, we cannot resolve, in order to resolve the cluster formation efficiency, uh, you would need to technically resolve the IMF or the, the, the formation of the IMF which means a, a computational dy dynamic range problem that is presently not possible. So we have basically we have an analytical subgrid model that says, okay, as a function of galaxy, local galaxy properties, this is what we would expect, would predict for the uh, cluster formation efficiency. Okay. And uh, these are models that have been like each of these subgrid models themselves has been tested against observations in dozens of papers. So we have some confidence that these are reasonable starting points. It's basically what we know of cluster formation in the local universe. And then the question is, if we apply that to the evolving cosmic conditions, do we get out global clusters? Okay. And that's, that's the question. So as I mentioned, this for, at first we had 25 cosmological zoom-in simulations of Milky Way mass galaxies and their satellites. Um, this is sort of the definitive set. But then in addition, we ran hundreds of simulations varying those subgrid models, trying to see exactly what we could rely on, what had an impact on the, on, on the cluster populations, what didn't, where the uncertainties are and so on, to really convince ourselves of the elements we could trust and the elements we could not trust. And once we had completed those, we then in addition com completed a 34 megaparsec uh, volume, which you see here on the bottom right, which now has a very large uh, population of Milky Way mass galaxies and goes all the way up to a Fornax cluster. So we've not done a lot of science with that, but it's very exciting that we can now start working with that. Now there were two main results coming out of the mosaics. First is, and I will only show one slide on this, is that indeed we can reproduce both young cluster populations and globular clusters with the same star cluster model. And I'm showing two examples here. So on the left, uh, we see the age distribution of young clusters uh, where the simulations uh, have a median, here is the black dashed line, and then observations are the symbols, of typical age distributions in nearby galaxies. And you see that we actually, we do a decent job in reproducing the rough slope that that age distribution has, which means that we have a reasonable treatment of cluster disruption. Now, in addition, what you see here on the right is one of the many observables that we compare to the globular cluster population, 
as we're in black, you see the observed spatial distribution of globular clusters around the Milky Way. And then in, in light gray, you see all of these simulated spatial profiles for a 25 zoom in simulation. Again, follow very similar uh, spatial profiles. Now, as I mentioned, these are just two observables. We've done many, but I'd like to focus on the second question that I asked, which is how can we use globular clusters to reconstruct galaxy formation in the center? And historically, in the Milky Way, this type of work has really focused strongly on the age metallicity distribution of globular clusters. So here on the uh, y-axis, we've got metallicity. On the x-axis, we've got the age. You get this very characteristic sort of forked shape, sort of a Y shape, where you have a relatively vertical branch here and a branch coming off. And for reasons that will become clear in about one slide, uh, this is what I'd like to call the main branch. And this is what I like to call the satellite branch. And in Nima's eggs, we can figure out very directly why that is. So here I'm showing uh, six different edge metallicity distributions for six different Milky Way mass galaxies of the globular clusters in Nima's eggs. So the symbols here are the globular clusters, uh, color coded by their galactocentric radius. And the contours here are the field stars within the same galaxy. So it's basically the star formation history and in the enrichment history of the host galaxy. And what we see here is that by and large, uh, the globular clusters trace periods of intense field star formation. Whenever there's a lot of contours, you tend to get globular clusters too. But, you know, of course, all of those distributions have roughly the same trend, as in metallicity goes up as these galaxies evolve. But in addition, we actually see distinct differences. Some of them are very gradual, like this one, whereas other ones are quite steep, like here. And these differences actually result from differences in the galaxy formation and assembly histories. And um, already what I kind of indicated on the previous slide, if you get low metallicity young globular clusters, these formed in lower mass galaxies because lower mass galaxies chemically enrich more slowly. So these basically trace accretion events. You can be pretty confident that those globular clusters are ex situ and the ones that shoot up very quickly here to high metallicities are in situ. And what that allows us to do is link individual globular clusters to their progenitor galaxies. Now here, just for comparison, here are the merger trees of the same galaxies. And you can see very directly what I just mentioned, right? This gradual uh, H metallicity distribution has a very quiescent merger history, whereas this very steep H metallicity distribution has a very intense merger history with lots of mergers. So you can really start to use this type of demographic to learn about how the parent galaxy formed. Now with Gaia and the Milky Way, we don't just have ages and metallicities. We also have kinematics. And uh, a lot of groups have actually started to group globular clusters in orbital space. So this is work that, that Helmer was involved in uh, two years ago. And um, basically uh, what, what, what Masari, Helmer, and, and Amina did um, was to try and group these globular clusters such that they uh, could be connected to individual merger events that the Milky Way experienced. Now, what we've tried to do with EMAS eggs is connect those groups of globular clusters to groups of similar groups of globular clusters that we saw in the simulation, to that way try and infer uh, what the properties of the progenitor galaxies were. And the way we did that is we used a neural network to link the globular cluster ages, metallicities, and orbits of these groups that are thought to have come from the same progenitor to the mass of the progenitor satellite galaxy and the redshift at which it merged with the central. So we basically took all globular cluster rich accretion events from e-mosaics to train the network to, to, to connect the globular cluster properties to these galaxy observables. And by doing that and varying the hyperparameters of the neural network, we would get probability distribution functions on exactly these quantities. So I'm showing here for five accretion events where Masari and collaborators were able to group those globular clusters. Uh, for those five uh, accretion events, we analyzed globular clusters this way and measured that way, or predicted the masses of the galaxies that they came from. And we found that there were three massive accretion events. The first here uh, is what we call Kraken, then Gaia Enceladus, which is the famous one that, again, Helmer was involved in, and then Sagittarius, which is the one that is already known since 1994. We found that all of these accretion events of masses of several 10 to the 8 solar masses, but roughly similar. 
And the two other accretion events that we look at here, so the progenitor of the Helmi streams and Sequoia, were likely much less massive or considerably less massive, factor of a few. But what is interesting is that those different galaxies actually merged with the Milky Way at very different accretion redshifts. So what we see here is that Kraken was an early merger, Gaia Enceladus an intermediate merger, and Sagittarius, of course, we still see the debris, is a very recent merger. And it turns out if we look at the neural network, we can, of course, figure out where that difference in redshifts come, comes from. It is basically, it's a combination of the, the galaxy mass and the binding energy. And these two are related because basically if you, uh, if you have similar mass galaxies and they have different binding energies, it means they must have accreted at the time that the Milky Way had a different mass. Uh, and in addition, we, of course, we have the age metallicity information, which tells us something about how quickly these satellites enriched and therefore how massive they were. And in combination, you can basically, you can solve the, the, the mass accretion redshift degeneracy that way. Now, despite the fact that they all have the same mass, we see that they accreted at very different redshifts. And that means that the Milky Way had very different masses during each of those mergers. And if we combine that information, we find that uh, we can calculate the merger mass ratio of each of those. And we find that Kraken was basically the most major merger that the Milky Way experienced. It's still a minor merger. It's very small, only one to 30, but the most major. And we also find this way that the Milky Way didn't have any major mergers since Richard four, which is a very long time to have such a quiescent life. But maybe that's why we exist. Maybe that's why we exist. And that's what the second part of this talk touches on. So putting those results together, this is what a rough sketch of the Milky Way merger tree would look like. So we have those five galaxies that we uh, can now characterize in some detail. Then based on the number of globular clusters that the Milky Way has, we expect another 10 mergers uh, with masses more than 5 million solar masses and stars. And of course, that debris is not known yet, so we, we still need to find those. But it's the first time that we can start drawing this merger tree, and I think that's really exciting because, you know, for me as a, a simulator by, by nature and nurture kind of, uh, this is something I used to do for simulations, doing it for the Milky Way, I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, one of the really uh, interesting results coming out of EMASX is that we actually predicted the existence of Kraken based on the globular clusters. And uh, Masari then found that group of globular clusters in the galactic halo. And uh, Horta and collaborators now have found actually the stellar debris as well, which is part of the bulge. So it, Kraken, basically the, the core of Kraken made it in quite far into the Milky Way. Uh, and that's very encouraging because it means that apparently uh, we can be we can have some confidence about the predictive power of the simulations okay so that for me concludes the the part of looking up towards larger scales now i would like to spend a little bit of time zooming in and seeing okay how does stellar clustering actually affect the properties of planetary protoplanetary disks during planet formation and how might it modify the properties of the planet population as we zoom in Now, as we, uh, I think, have known for, for decades at this point, uh, star formation is hierarchically structured. If we look at molecular clouds in the solar neighborhood, uh, we see these very nice hierarchical structures. And also in simulations, of course, these are well known. So I'm showing here the simulation by Matthew Bates. And in the dense substructures that you form this way, external photo evaporation by nearby massive stars and also dynamical interactions between the stars are really common processes. And in the simulation, you actually see uh, several of the stars being ejected dynamically. Now, observationally, we've known this for a while too, since the mid nineties. So this is a, a picture of uh, the Orion Nebula cluster taken with HST. And in mid nineties, Odell and collaborators found these very nice protoplanetary disks that were irradiated by the nearby massive stars. And the ionization fronts are really pronounced, right? So you can see that the disks are actually being photo evaporated by these nearby massive stars. And there's this entire zoo of protoplanetary disks with different morphologies due to this external irradiation. Now, interestingly, they actually, that, that there, there are actually quantitative statistical differences um, between protoplanetary disks residing in different environments. And this is actually, this is the paper through which I kind of got interested in this field. It was already from nearly a decade ago, but the, um, 
this is a, basically at the time was a literature comp compilation of known protoplanetary disk sizes, which are plotted here as a function of the projected stellar number density. And then basically trying to compare the disk radius distribution as a function of that stellar number density and, and running statistical tests between all those bins to see if there was maybe a transition towards the high density end. And indeed, it was a marginal significance at the time, but we found this signal that the uh, disk radius distribution was truncated at large radii once you started to get to those really high density environments. So these are all Orion Nebula cluster disks, by the way. So there were no disks larger than 200 AU once you got about above about 5,000 stars per square parsec. Now, in the years after, it turns out actually people started to measure disk masses with ALMA and uh, this, this result kind of persisted. So this is now showing the dust mass of protoplanetary disks in Orion as a function of their separation from uh, Sigma Orionis. And what you see here is again, there's this uh, dearth of massive disks as you get close to the massive star here. So that has led us, that, that has led us to start thinking about how this could potentially be modeled. And um, that is, this again is, is a very complicated problem. So this is just showing a little bit of preliminary work here. This work by Maya Petkova here in Heidelberg, who has been developing a live radiative transfer scheme using uh, Voronoi tessellations that you can run live uh, on smooth particle hydrodynamics. And what you basically see is the moment you switch on this single ionizing source here in the middle, it very quickly ionizes the, vacu the, the evacuated uh, region here and starts to push this ionization front into the cloud. And with basically with models like this, it becomes possible to start actually modeling the irradi irradiation of the protoplanetary disk. So this is something we're currently working on, this aspect of the problem. The other side of the problem we have already modeled. So this is a stellar cluster of sort of trapezium sizes, very small, but definitely trapezium density. And these are individual star particles that have uh, that have single uh, protoplanetary disks sitting around them. And there's modeled in an n-body simulation. And basically what you see here is those interactions between the stars drive these tidal tails throughout the cluster and start dispersing the protoplanetary disks. There are a couple of close encounters that really blow up the disk um, relatively close to the beginning of the movie. Yeah, here you can see them quite nicely. And this is a process that one might expect to happen, but obviously only in, in, in the dense, in the very densest environments. So the question is now, if you look at those processes, when do they take place? Under which conditions? Which fraction of the stars that form have planetary systems or protoplanetary disks that actually are subjected to those uh, conditions? And to describe that, we've uh, you can use the gas density PDF, which in the interstellar medium follows a nice log normal and the width of that PDF increases with the gas pressure. So if you use that gas PDF, which is here the solid line, on the left, what you have is low densities and therefore long freefall times. On the right, you have high densities and short freefall times. So if you then let that, those pockets of gas form stars, then at the low end, because you have a long freefall time, you will only form very few stars. But on the right, because you have a very short freefall time, you will form a lot of stars per unit time. So you get a high star formation efficiency on the right and a low star formation efficiency on the left. So basically what you get is at low gas densities, you'll get stellar associations like the image you see here. And here on the right, you get dense stellar clusters like proto-globular clusters. Now, this is really is a critical uh, ingredient if you want to make a statistical prediction for what the environments are in which protoplanetary disks form and evolve. And the reason is, is that this PDF can be used to link basically between the galactic scale conditions and the small scale conditions. And the reason is, is that in a hydrostatic equilibrium disk, you can define the density PDF using galaxy scale quantities, basically just the gas surface density of your disk, how quickly it is rotating and how stable it is. Galactic disk, not protoplanetary disk. Then that defines the PDF, but then within the PDF, using the PDF, you can predict the stellar density. And the stellar density you can use to predict the initial cluster mass distribution, uh, how well stochastically sampled the initial mass function is, so therefore what your local far UV radiation field is going to be, what your disk evaporation, photo evaporation rate is going to be, 
and also because you have the stellar density, what your dynamical destruction rate is by stellar flat plots. So basically what you can do with this is you can start to predict disk lifetimes as a function of this large scale galactic environment. And that's what we did here in this paper uh, with Andrew Winter from uh, early, early last year, where basically we can, in the plane of far UV flux density versus stellar number density, we can predict where stars are forming. So we basically can take that 1D PDF of the density of the interstellar medium and turn it into this 2D PDF of where, what, what the formation environments of protoplanetary disks are. And that's the gray shaded histogram that you see here. It's basically for solar neighborhood conditions where we expect stars and planetary systems to form. And now here uh, over plotted for reference are a bunch of observed regions. So we see actually we reproduce the observed regions pretty well. Now the blue lines are predicted disk lifetimes due to external disk dispersal. And the horizontal part here is due to external photo evaporation. So if we have higher far UV strengths, we get shorter disk lifetimes. And here the vertical part is from uh, dynamical encounters with nearby stars. So we see, see basically that this part is rarely important for protoplanetary disks. In protoplanetary disks, we really care about the photo evaporation. Now we see that in the solar neighborhood, it's only a few percent of the disks that are actually disrupted within a mega year. So it's not that important. But if we now scale this to the conditions that are typical for the central molecular zone of the Milky Way, so it's the near the galactic center, we see that of the order 90%, more than 90% of the disks are actually disrupted by external photo evaporation in less than a mega year. And the reason that this is so important is that the conditions of the interstellar medium in the galactic center are quite similar to the conditions that the Milky Way interstellar medium experienced at high redshift. So the right-hand panel kind of gives us an idea of how most stars in the Milky Way actually form. It's not what the solar neighborhood looks like at the present day. This is more what most stars in the Milky Way formed like. And I would bet that we probably, like the solar system and us probably could not have originated in such an environment. Maybe that is why we only form now. So if we then look at what the disk lifetime PDFs are, we can be a bit more quantitative. We see that in the uh, central molecular zone, there's the red lines here, disks live about five times shorter than in the solar neighborhood. And there is also a dependence on stellar mass. So the, the, the solid line here is for basically all the stars. If we restrict ourselves only to stars more massive than one solar mass, we see that disks actually live a bit longer. And that's because the binding energy of the star is larger. So it's harder to photo evaporate off the disk, basically. But what this means is that we get a really distinct imprint of stellar clustering on the protoplanetary disk lifetime for most of the conditions of planet formation in, in the Milky Way's history. Now, of course, the question then is, does this actually affect the planet population or not? And this is an extremely important question, but very, very challenging, because most of the planets that we know have ages older than a giga year. And what that means is that the overdensity that they formed in, the overdensity of their stellar birth environment, no longer exists. So in order to answer this question, we can't just look for overdensities in physical space. But it might be possible that if structures have dispersed, that they are still co-moving. And that means that there might be structure in position velocity space. And with Gaia, we've set out to test this. So we've basically, uh, we've taken all known exoplanet host stars with uh, known radial velocities for which we had 60 phase space information. And then we determined the 60 phase space density around those stars. We checked for biases, for instance, dependence on, on host stellar mass and so on. And then we tried to compare the planet properties as a function of the ambient phase space density. And I'm just gonna reiterate that here we kept checking for biases and biases and biases. And I'll come back to that numerous times because this is really important, right? We're, the, the selection function of the exoplanet population is, is quite heterogeneous. It's really important to be careful about this. So let me uh, illustrate briefly how this works. So this is showing for two different planetary systems. So HD phone number and WASP-12 is showing what the, the physical space distribution is of stars in their vicinity. And you see immediately is there is no structure here. This is just a flat density field. But if we now go to velocity space, so this is showing galactic radial velocity and galactic uh, azimuthal velocity, there is phase space structure, right? So there's a very nice overdensity here, and there's another one here. 
So what we then do is for each of those uh, uh, stars that you see here in the field of view, we calculate what the local uh, phase space density is, and we draw a histogram of that. And what we found is that for the vast majority of the stars for which we did this, the phase space density distribution in the immediate environment can be described by a double log normal. So what that means is there is a low density component, which I'll refer to as field, and there's a high density component, which I'll refer to as over density. And we carried out a Gaussian mixture model of these, this, these bimodal distributions to then assign a probability to each planetary system that it belongs to the field component or to the over density component. The one you see here on the left, so the vertical line indicates where the planetary system is sitting. The one here on the left has a very high probability that's part of the low density component, whereas the one here on the right has a very high probability of being part of the over density. So that we can then use to classify the observed planet population. Now, an important thing to add is we, this, is, this measures the current phase space density. We do not know if this reflects the birth environment of the planetary system. It might be possible that this formed later through resonances in the galaxy. Uh, we're sitting quite close to co-rotation here in the solar neighborhood. And Gaia has found over densities that seem to be associated with galactic structure rather than birth structure. And I personally actually think it's related to that more than birth structure, but we can talk about that. Okay. Now, before I show you how the planet populations differ between over densities in the field, I first want to check biases because that is important. So what is shown here is the cumulative distribution function of the host stellar mass, the stellar metallicity, the stellar age, and the distance for overdensities in the field. And throughout the figures, overdensities are red and the field is in blue. What we did is we applied stellar mass cuts and stellar age cuts to make them consistent across both samples. And as you see here, indeed, the stellar mass, metallicity, and age are basically statistically indistinguishable. They're consistent with being drawn from the same population. This is not true for the distance. So you see that there is actually a significant difference here. It turns out if you, uh, so we, we made an initial distance cut at 300 parsecs, then the distributions are indistinguishable. And it turns out our results that I'm about to show actually persist. So this distance difference yeah, is just there. It turns out over densities are a little bit further away than pure field on average, but it does not actually affect the results. Okay, so the result, is in short is this. So this is showing the planet mass on the y-axis as a function of the semi-major axis at which the planet is orbiting. And on the left, I'm showing field systems. And on the right, I'm showing systems in over densities here defined through cuts in, in the Gaussian mixture model uh, P value of which component the system belongs to. Now, the immediate obvious difference here is if you look at the hot Jupiter corner of the plot is that there is a major difference between both. But the first order, you can, you can first quantify that just by looking at the median semi-major axis, uh, which differs by an order of magnitude between both samples. So in over densities, the semi-major axis is a factor of 10 smaller than in the field. But indeed, then, if we look also at the combination here in hot Jupiters, uh, many, uh, most of the hot Jupiters in the entire sample actually reside in over densities, 92%. And then if we look at the few hot Jupiters that actually reside in the field, many of them sit in confirmed binaries. So it seems that these might have been hot, might have become hot Jupiters because they were perturbed by a binary, whereas on the ones on the right might have become hot Jupiters because they reside in overdensities, or at least that's the strong suggestion that's being made here. There's also a difference here, by the way, at the low mass end in, in the radius distribution, although of course we can't see any planets here, but there is a, a very distinct uh, scattered population here, whereas this one seems to be well behaved and, and follow this rough trend. So we spent a year trying to get rid of this result. Um, we tried varying the threshold probabilities for, for the classification of, of field and over densities. We tried all kinds of cuts since our age, metallicity and distance. We uh, restricted exoplanet detection methods, so only looking at transit detections or only radial velocity detections. We even restricted restricted ourselves to only Kepler planets, etc., and we were not able to get rid of it. Um, so if anyone has an idea of some bias that we should have checked, something that we might have missed, please tell me, because uh, yeah, at some point we decided to just write it up and, and, and submit it, but 
it is still entirely possible that we missed something and we're still checking everything uh, on a regular basis. But the result so far is that stellar clustering does indeed shape the properties of planetary systems. And this extends further. So we've had a, a set of follow-up papers where we uh, looked into this further. So one other result that we found here in a paper by Steve Longmore is that stellar clustering affects planetary multiplicity. And there is a very well-known excess of single planet systems in Kepler. It's called the Kepler dichotomy. Uh, it's basically, if you look at the multiplicity here, then uh, simple models basically predict the yellow stars. And then Kepler finds this huge excess of single planet systems. Now, what we find is that that excess of single planet systems uh, is actually driven by overdensities. Sure, the field also has a slight excess of single planet systems, but overdensities much more strongly so. So that is a suggestion that maybe overdensities play a role, so that our clustering plays a role in driving this Kepler dichotomy. Basically, I would say maybe, maybe planetary systems are dynamically perturbed and that is why actually we get these single planet systems. Now, another main Kepler result is, is that similar or that the planets have similar neighbors. So neighboring planets have similar properties. They have similar radii and they actually also have similar masses. And this behavior has been called uh, peas in a pod. And uh, the, this uniformity of radii where basically the radius of an inner planet is correlated to the radius of its outer neighbor. Um, that correlation is actually a little bit stronger in overdensities. Now, if, the, if we go with the hypothesis that these systems have been perturbed and have been shuffled around, then it means that this uniformity of planet properties is not between neighbors, but is actually system-wide, right? If you shuffle around the orbits and therefore change the neighboring order, then it means, okay, if the correlation is actually a little bit stronger in overdensities, then it means we're actually correlated on a system-wide scale rather than just between neighbors. And that is interesting. So planets seem to know not just about their neighbors, but actually about the system that they reside in. And then finally, it actually has a uh, stellar clustering might actually affect um, sort of atmospheric properties of planets as well. So a, a third key Kepler result is, is that there is this radius valley where uh, above this uh, sort of gap in radii, you've got sub-Neptunes, which are very gas-rich uh, hydrogen helium envelopes. And below here, we've got super-Earths that do not. And there are various different uh, hypotheses for what might drive this radius valley. Um, but typically, the, the hypothesis is that basically this, this sub-Neptune gas envelope is lost and therefore the planet ends up below it. And ideas are things like evaporation from, from the single host star or basically heating from the core of the planet itself that slowly sheds the atmosphere. What we see here is that only overdensity planets are actually below the radius valley. In the field, they're all above, which suggests that maybe overdensities instead of clustering play a role in helping planets get rid of their atmospheres. Now, of course, it's small numbers, but it is statistically significant. So it's still preliminary, but, but who knows what we'll find over the next year or two. Okay, that concludes what I would, wanted to say about the planets here. And I would like to zoom out very briefly to bring this all together. Because in EMAS eggs, we can look at how the clustering of stars at birth varies as a function of redshift throughout cosmic history. And that is what I'm showing here. So this is showing what I mentioned uh, as of when I was talking about EMAS eggs before. This is showing the fraction of stars born in clusters, the cluster formation efficiency, as a function of redshift in one of our Milky Way mass zoom in simulations. And this is a very consistent prediction is the fraction of stars born in clusters increases with redshift, simply because the gas pressure and gas density is higher at higher redshift. What this means is that at higher redshift, many more planetary systems were affected by their environment than at low redshift. One thing you might notice here is those spikes. Those spikes are galaxy mergers. These are galaxy mergers that increase the gas pressure within the galaxy and therefore drive a higher cluster formation efficiency. And therefore, as a result of the results that I just showed, correspondingly more environmental perturbation of planetary systems. So these are really, these are mega parsec scale events that affect the AU scale properties of planetary systems. And I think that is an extremely exciting idea that, that these types of processes cross such a wide dynamic range. 
And there is actually a recent result uh, about the, the solar system here. This is showing the star formation history of the solar neighborhood. And it turns out the solar system formed here shortly after a starburst that was triggered by the Sagittarius merger. Right, so there's the, the merger that we identified here in the merger tree earlier. So that's interesting. If the solar system did not form in relative isolation, then maybe nearby protoplanetary disks tell us less about our own origins than we might have thought, maybe. Okay, with that, I would like to conclude. I'm, I apologize for going a little bit over. Um, basically, the, the, the theme of this talk is, is to what extent does stellar clustering connect the formation and evolution of galaxies to the formation and evolution of us? And I would argue it actually does. Stellar clustering drives the baryon cycle in galaxies. It disrupts giant molecular clouds by early feedback. And we can actually take that now from observations and use it as a subgrid model for galaxy evolution. And then once we've described the interstellar medium well, we can start using the simulations of the galaxies that we get to describe the stellar cluster population from high redshift till the present day and use those globular clusters to reconstruct the assembly history of the Milky Way. And throughout that, around those stars, protoplanetary disks formed and their lifetimes are dependent on that degree of stellar clustering, especially at high gas densities and pressures, photo evaporation and dynamics truncate their lifetimes. Now, somewhat amusingly, it turns out that the individual planet populations seem to be affected by this as well. They're shaped by stellar clustering to some degree. We don't understand why yet or how, but empirically the architectures of the planetary systems and the planet properties themselves are correlated with the stellar clustering in their environment. So I started this talk by saying that our existence is one of the biggest multi-scale astrophysics problems. And you know, it's a real challenge to understand this, but I hope to I have convinced you that this is starting to become a tractable problem. We can actually start thinking about this. And that means that when, when faced with this enormous challenge, I, I don't think we should look scared, but, but cool, we should relish the challenge and try and do something with it. So thank you. Apologies again for running over. Well, thank you for a, a fantastically wide ranging talk. Um, we'll uh, take maybe five minutes or so for questions now, and then uh, we'll, uh, we can go get lunch and Diedrich can uh, run home and get dinner. Um, and then those who would uh, like to join for, uh, for more detailed follow-up, uh, we'll meet again at, at 1.30 at this same link. Um, Roman, you go first. Uh, hi, Dietrich. Uh, very uh, stimulating uh, talk, very uh, provocative and interesting. Uh, I had a question about uh, planets, uh, actually, you know, this relation, these over densities. So you uh, seem to separate things into two uh, kind of, well, into the binary categories, right? Field and clusters. But how clustered are clusters? Do you have any correlation with like uh, cluster densities, you know, of all these parameters that you have uh, shown actually? Multiplicity yeah. of planets, you know, disk truncation and so on and so forth. I mean, yeah. Uh, this is a really good question. And uh, we, the fundamental problem is, is that Gaia is not necessarily complete. So when we calculate the phase space density here, we are dealing with a, uh, with a selection function that is not necessarily well described. And therefore, what we've done here is we've actually, uh, here on the x-axis, we always use the normalized phase space density. So we always normalize by the mean within the volume that we're considering. Now, that means you can do your decomposition, but you don't know what the meaning is of the phase space density in an absolute sense. Now, despite that, we've done what you just asked because we just wanted to know, right? Okay, if we just, let's say we pretend that everything is complete, then this, this even this normalized uh, phase space density will have some meaning. Let's just use that. It turns out that we do not see, uh, I don't think we have the statistical significance, like the sample size, to see trends with that number, at least not for the population at large, uh, there the problem is, the initial problem is the heterogeneity actually, it's just, you've got many different types of planets, mm -hmm. so this is becoming a problem. What you can do is you can try to cut to specific planet types and see if then there is a trend with that number. Have you seen but yeah, then you run into the small sample size. Have you seen trends with hot Jupiters? I mean, the one thing you showed is uh, very striking for hot Jupiters. Do you have any trend there? We have not looked at that yet, no. Ah. 
Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't know that. We have not made the cut of only looking at hot Jupiters and then trying to do all those things. No, it's a, basically, we're a small group of people and there is a very large number of things that you can do. So, um, okay, yeah, this is a really good idea. Uh, I, I will try to look at this over the next few days and actually ping you if I have an answer. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so could you say a little more about what you think the physical origin of the, the dichotomy between the field and overdensity in phase space is? That's a really good question. Um, I've had, with the team, we have had a long history of going back and forth between a lot of things here. The problem is that uh, birth overdensities should disperse much faster really, even in phase space, even as co-moving groups should disperse much faster than the ages of these planetary systems. And indeed, uh, we've, we've done a preliminary cross-match of uh, the uh, planetary systems and, and their neighbors uh, in our catalog in Gaia uh, with chemical surveys. And if you look at the chemical abundances uh, in these overdensities, they actually, fine, they're a bit smaller than just across the field, but it's definitely not a single uh, chemical population. So that suggests that the stars in overdensities were not born together. The question is then, okay, what are these overdensities? Are they uh, ripples in, in phase space that are driven by, by resonances, by perturbations from nearby mergers or otherwise? Uh, I personally do not know the answer, but uh, I see a qualitative correlation between the structures that we see in velocity space here and the quite well-known structures in velocity space that have been studied with Gaia that are attributed to resonances in the galactic disk. So, so I mean, I, I, I agree with you that without having done the calculation, it seems unlikely that inhomogeneities yeah. associated with the birthplaces would uh, change. But, you know, the problem with the alternative is that... Uh, in any dissipationless system, phase space densities are conserved. Yes. So you, can, you can move things around all you want with the bar and with resonances and so forth. But if it's not dissipative, it's not gonna change the phase space density. Yep. Yes. It's a, it's a really good point. And I think this is, a, this is a conundrum that we're actively thinking about at the moment. Um, if you have ideas. <laughs> well, if I have ideas, I'll write them out. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> um, any other questions? Okay, well, thanks. This was great. Um, and, uh, and some of us will, uh, will meet up with you again uh, in a little over an hour. So um, but, uh, thanks for covering uh, uh, dynamic range of 10 to the 18th. <laughs> Thank you very much. I look forward to uh, chatting. <laughs>